in entrepreneurship, if you're starting your own business and you're running your own business, your exit strategy at some point should be in your mind to say, I'm going to eventually exit this as retirement or to move on to other ventures or to do whatever. And you wanna make sure you can sell that asset to either fund your retirement or fund your next operation, whatever you're doing. And unfortunately, retail arbitrage is not going to be a viable option for you Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and we are going to talk about retail arbitrage today. Y'all know this is one of my favorite <laughs> topics to talk about. Okay, let's be real. Um, I am not a hater of retail arbitrage or online arbitrage. As a matter of fact, it's a really great place to get started and kind of get your feet wet without spending a lot of money on Amazon. But all work from home business models come with their share of pitfalls and as an amazon business this is no different and today i'm going to talk about the common mistakes that people make when doing retail arbitrage and online arbitrage and thrifting and things like that for your amazon store and how it's different from other business models on Amazon, what risks are involved, but also how to avoid a lot of that if you are if you really enjoy it, if it's something that you're doing and making, yeah, you can make a lot of money on it for sure. I mean, in the beginning of my Amazon business, I made a ton of money for many, many years doing retail arbitrage. However, um, I don't believe it's the best business model anymore. I don't believe it's long-term sustainable and can get you the income that you're probably desiring from this business. And because of that, I am going to have a caveat, <laughs> however you say that word, I always say it wrong, um, the, the foreign words I struggle with. So anyway, I want to talk about the mistakes to avoid when doing retail arbitrage, but reality is I don't really want you doing retail arbitrage. I would love you to do something that's more sustainable, um, less risky, and more just can get, just put more money in your pocket for a lot less work. So retail arbitrage is a lot of work. And so we want to go through the first way to avoid all these mistakes is to avoid retail arbitrage in, in, in the beginning. And right here and now, you know, guys know that I talk about wholesale bundles a lot for a reason, because wholesale bundles rescued my business from the retail arbitrage prison that I was in. And although I loved it and was making money, I know you're like, why did you stop something that you loved and was making money? Well, because eventually... I got so overwhelming and so much to do that it could not be scaled. And I wanted to scale and grow my business beyond the plateau that I was at. And so because of that, I started to look for more options. So I'm gonna tell you all the mistakes that I have made and some other clients have made with retail arbitrage and how you can avoid them while you're still doing that, while you're transitioning to wholesale bundles, hopefully. Um, and the best way to maximize your profits, to eliminate competition and do it all in less time, with less money than private label or any other other business model on Amazon is wholesale bundles. And because you're still sitting here listening right now, I have an absolute special never been done before kind of offer for you that's only good for three days. So write this down, stop your car, press pause, do whatever it is that you're doing. Because if you're interested in wholesale bundles, especially after this episode, I have a three day 50% off coupon for wholesale bundle system. Shh. Don't be sharing this with everybody else. You know why? Because I never, ever, 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 ever <laughs> have done 50% off of wholesale bundles. And this is only three days. So you guys that are listening and subscribe to the podcast and watch every episode religiously when it comes out, you guys are getting a great bonus right now. You're going to get wholesale bundle system for 50% off only for the next three days. Mommyincome.com forward slash system. Your coupon code is all caps, half off. That is literally only good for three days from right now. So if you go into mommyincome.com slash system and you want wholesale bundles and you've been waiting for a deal or a coupon code, now is your chance. You have three days to take advantage of this. Why? Because I'm so passionate about getting away from retail arbitrage and getting into something more sustainable, more with the ability to have sellable assets in the end. So you're not building a business just to make some money on the side or make some cash right now. 
you're building a business so that eventually when you're all done with it, this word called retirement comes up, no, no matter if you're 29 or 69 or 82, whenever you want to retire, you will have a sellable asset. A retail arbitrage business is not a sellable asset. No one's going to offer you money for your retail arbitrage business. Even if you have the best systems and processes in place, a good business buyer will not buy your business with a retail arbitrage supply chain. It's not trustworthy. It's not reliable. It's not something that you can count on. And honestly, it's a good way to start, but it's never a good way to finish. So if you're there, you got to start thinking about your future of your business and having it grow or having it be something that you've worked so hard for that then you can't sell. You don't want to have that. It's almost like working for a company for however many years you work for and you walk away with nothing. There's no 401k. There's no retirement plan. There's no anything. You just gave your 20 years of service to this company for nothing. So in entrepreneurship, if you're starting your own business and you're running your own business, your exit strategy at some point should be in your mind to say, I'm going to eventually exit this as retirement or to move on to other ventures or to do whatever. And you want to make sure you can sell that asset to either fund your retirement or fund your next operation, whatever you're doing. And Unfortunately, retail arbitrage is not going to be a viable option for you to be able to sell. Now, you can still do some retail arbitrage if your main business model doesn't include, or is not reliant on that. So maybe 5% of your sales is relied on, on retail arbitrage, then um, you might have options. But the reality is that investors of a company, a business, a brand, whatever it is that you're building on Amazon, even if it's just a wholesale products, even if it's just a storefront, does not matter. If you can have reliable supply chains and you can hand over your company to someone who can reorder these products and continue running your business the way that you run it, that's very desirable for people. So I don't just preach about retail arbitrage being kind of a secondhand type of um, way for no reason. It's because I really want you guys to not only build and grow a legitimate business, but then when you're done with it or you're sick of it or you're just tired or some life happens and you decide to go in a different direction, you have something to sell. Instead of just being like, oh, I'm closing my store and moving on and just don't have any money, don't have any assets, don't have any anything. No. Do it right up front so that even in two years, if you want to sell your business, you will have a good established business. Now, I know that's not what we were talking about, but I, I mean, it kind of leads into what we were talking about, other oh, retail arbitrage mistakes, because I know some of you, many of you, a lot of you are still doing retail arbitrage. I do about... 1% of my sales will come from some sort of arbitrage um, method, but it's literally such a tiny sliver that it really doesn't even matter much in my particular business. So mommyincome.com slash system coupon code is half off. If you want half off of retail arbitrage or I'm sorry, <laughs> If you want to have off of wholesale bundle system for the next three days, this is, I've never ever done this before. So 50% off, that's half off is your coupon code, mommyincome.com slash system. And you're going to want that, especially after you hear the stories today and some of the stuff of retail arbitrage that you want to avoid. Maybe some of you are doing all this. It's time to get out. This is your opportunity. So what let's get into retail arbitrage oh and a code word you guys um I, everyone keeps saying oh you mentioned code words sometimes and not all the times and i want to get into the facebook group and i don't have a code word your code word is ra mistakes retail arbitrage mistakes is your code word mommyincome.com forward slash join us come into the facebook group use your code word there it is don't say i didn't give you one because I haven't in the last couple of weeks, and that's okay. <laughs> I forget sometimes. Okay. What is retail arbitrage? Brief definition. It is buying something from a retail store and reselling it someplace else. It's called arbitrage. We call it retail arbitrage because you're going to a retail store to then purchase something on clearance, um, something that has a price differentiation between buying and selling. Um, so online arbitrage, retail arbitrage is going into physical stores, buying items on clearance or just like things that aren't available on Amazon or new trendy items, whatever that is. However you do arbitrage, 
that's retail arbitrage. Online arbitrage is simply doing that except only buying from websites, buying online. So you're not actually going to physical stores and collecting that. And then thrifting is another form of retail arbitrage, only it's more garage sales, things like that, which you can still find brand new items and used items. A lot of people sell used books and that garage sales and yard sales and estate sales and uh, library book sales and all kinds of thrift stores and things like that are great places to find some decent inventory to flip on Amazon. But we're talking about the retail and online arbitrage. People are buying brand new items to resell on the Amazon platform, buying them from retail establishments. So when I say retail arbitrage, I'm also talking about online arbitrage as well. So you're just like, oh, I don't do RA, but I do OA. Same difference. Uh, retail, online, all these things that you're buying stuff from stores and not from wholesale companies or manufacturers. So that's all what retail arbitrage is. And we're going to go over some of the common mistakes and basically how you fix them, because I know some of you are still doing retail arbitrage and you're not into wholesale bundling yet. And that's OK, because you got to just bloom where you're planted and that's where you're planted right now. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the common mistakes because people make mistakes when they're starting out retail arbitrage. They're like, I think I can do this. It's just basic math, right? It's just going in and saying, oh, this sells for $20 on Amazon. I can buy it for $10 at Target. I win the end. Don't we wish it was that easy? It is easier, but not quite that easy because we've got other fees and other things to factor in. So one of the most common mistakes that retail arbitrage folks make is only looking at the sales rank, the BSR, the best selling rank on Amazon when deciding to make a purchase. So you've got your Amazon seller app or you've got your Scoutify 2 or you've got some other scanning app that, that's giving you the information on Amazon of how many what is the sales rank? And what is the sales rank is what Amazon tells you how often this item sells, how good does it sell? The lower the number, the higher the sales. So then this is all estimated as well because Amazon doesn't really give us those numbers. Like you can't say that anything with a BSR, best selling rank of 10,000 sells 10,000 units a month. Like it doesn't translate that way. And so um, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's really kind of a muddy number to figure out. But basically, your basic bottom line is this. The lower the BSR, the best sellers rank, or I call it sales rank for for just because that's what I call it. <laughs> so you know, the sales rank on something is just a snapshot in time. And it's just an estimate of the lower the number sales rank, the better this item sells, the faster it sells. Now, that's also based on what category it's in. So like a BSR of a million in books sells way faster than something that has a BSR of a million in, say, home and kitchen or um, industrial and scientific in these categories. So um, because there are, I think, 24 million books listed. So if you're listing in a million and your sales rank is a million, that's not too bad. I mean, it's not a super fast seller like a 10,000, but it's still a snapshot in time. So you can, there's many, many pieces of data that you want to look at when it comes to, to retail arbitrage, but sales rank is just a snapshot in time. So it's like making a decision about you knowing who somebody is by seeing one picture of them. Of course, it's going to depend on the picture, right? <laughs> Maybe that's a bad analogy, but either way, like you see one photo of someone and yeah, you can draw a few conclusions, but you have no idea what that who that person is. You have no idea what they're doing, how they're doing, where they're doing. You don't have any other data points. You just have one picture of, you know, of somebody standing by a sunset or a mountain or doing something ridiculous and you're thinking, oh, I could probably draw some conclusions, but how accurate are they? It's just a snapshot. So if you think about that, when there's a BSR, a sales rank number on something that is in that moment in time, um, what what that item ranked according to all the other things. So it's a very fluid number as well. So it can change tomorrow. So, um, you know, the examples of best sellers rank are also, um, you know, today it could be 10,000 in rank and then it doesn't have sales for five days and all of a sudden it's at 100,000 rank. So this, the BSR is directly related to how often this item sells. So yes, it is a snapshot, but it is not the only piece of information that you're using. So only focusing on sales rank and say, oh, that sales rank is too high, not selling it. Well, did you look at other data? 
Did you look at the Keepa chart, which is usually uh, connected to your, especially if you have Scoutify 2. Um, and Scoutify 2 comes with Inventory Lab, by the way. If you do not have Inventory Lab, um, why not? First of all, Inventory Lab is fantastic. It's one of my must-have, cannot-live-without tools. Mommyincome.com slash Inventory Lab. Go get a free trial. It comes with a free scanning app that it's it's multiple users. So you have three or four or five people in your business or two of you or whatever else. You don't have to pay extra for that. And Scoutify will it also, um, it's a scanning app. It tells you, you scan the barcode of something in a store and it tells you this sells for $19.99 on Amazon. You enter your cost of goods, which is dollar. 50 say it's a book a dollar 50 um that i'm buying at a thrift store or something like that and it gives you your profit margin and gives you the fees and how much money you're going to make that comes free with an inventory lab subscription um it is my favorite and i use it to scan different things um all the time so uh scoutify 2 comes with inventory lab mommyincome.com slash inventory lab yes that is a affiliate link you're welcome i love inventory lab the yet Oh, okay, so you scan something and you see that and it also shows you a bestseller rank. But you need to check some other data points before you make a buying decision because it could be out of stock. And the reason why the sales rank is so high is because it's out of stock. Maybe it doesn't have a sales rank at all and then you just throw it out the window because you think it never sells. You have to know the data. The length of the product history makes a big deal. This product could be launched five days ago or five years ago. And if it was launched five years ago, you can look at the data there to see um, how often this item goes in and out of stock? How often it sells? Is it seasonal? Is it not seasonal? Is there a straight line across it? Like this consistently sells this many units a month for however long. So making sure that you're looking at all the pieces of information before you decide whether or not an item is good and sellable or not. Another piece of data that you need to look at is how many other sellers are offering this product. So when you look at your data, it says uh, offers or number of sellers or what number of offers, and it might say 5, 10, 15, could say 500. That's no joke. I've seen 500 people offer the same book for sale. You know, the same book that no one wants that you see on every thrift store, you see everywhere else. It's like, dude, this was Oprah's bestseller like 15 years ago and everybody has a copy of it and no one wants to buy it online. No one, you know, that sort of thing. We've seen all that before. So always looking at the number of offers, the sales rank, the length of product history, the price history. You also want to look at now you guys this can be done instantaneously these decisions and these look sees can be done within 15 uh, 15 to 30 seconds it's a matter of pressing a button looking at a keep a chart saying oh this looks a bit seasonal if you see it like uh, like kind of kind of looks like a squirrely line that goes up and down up and down that's either a stock issue or it's a a seasonal thing so you'll see okay january february march this thing goes really really well and it doesn't sell again until november it might be a winter based product. So those are types of things that you want to look at and keep in mind. Um, and also the reason the sales rank is so high or low, look at the reason. Maybe it's a fresh product. Maybe it's in stock. Maybe it's a seasonal thing. Maybe it has a new release. Maybe some celebrity just talked about it on their podcast and now um, it's super popular. So look into that. But you guys, this doesn't have to take forever. It can take 30 seconds to one minute to make a decision on this, looking at all the data points, because I know that time is money and people want to do things fast, fast, fast. But you know what happens when you do things fast? Mistakes. Retail arbitrage mistakes. Mistakes happen when you're doing it too fast. If you do something systematically in order in a process, number one, you come be automatically become more fast, faster and more efficient. But number two, you make less mistakes when you give yourself a time limit to make these decisions. So when you're scanning a product and you look at the things, maybe you have a five point data checklist in your mind or even on a cheat sheet, you know, get yourself a sticky note and be like, okay, check price history, check seasonality, check the reason for sales ranks, make sure it wasn't out of stock for the last six months, whatever else, look at these things and then decide yes or no based on all the data points, not just, okay, sales rank is a million, I'm done. Because you're gonna throw a lot of profit away doing that and all of your competition who's not lazy and has a process and a plan, they're gonna come up next and be like, oh, so <laughs> this person left this stuff in the wake and yet I'm over here scooping up all the profit. So check your data points, learn how to check them quickly, have a check 
list run through in your mind of like price history, seasonality, reason for sales rank, what is the sales rank, how many offers, yes or no based on that. And then of course your profit margin. So that's another thing too. So that's one of the first mistakes to avoid is making decisions too quickly or too slowly and not based on data. Look at the data, they're all the data is available. So when you're talking retail arbitrage, you're talking about scanning, yes or no. Profit, yes, there's profit there, great. If there's profit plus low sales rank, you might've found a great honey hole or you might found like pay dirt and you wanna scoop up everything that's there. And other times you realize, oh, maybe this is a great seller because it was trendy for a second, but then it's gonna go back out. Or the price history says that this is a fluke, it's out of stock, and so retail arbitrage is great, but as soon as Amazon gets it back, we're all gonna lose money. So pay attention to all all of these data points and quickly check them and say yes or no to your product based on that. Okay, number two, mistakes to avoid. Oh, this one you guys aren't gonna like. You're just not gonna like it because a lot of people buy lists, bolo lists, or they're following all these different gurus or Facebook groups or everything else. It's like, hey, here's a bolo. What's a bolo? Be on the lookout. That means somebody somewhere found a product that's killing it out there and they put it on a list and they sold that list to 500 people. And now 500 people have that same list and they're going out to look for these same very rare items. And then you buy stuff from that list instead of looking for your own golden nuggets, you're basically buying golden nuggets from other people. The problem is people spend a lot of time, money, and energy looking for these be on the lookout type items and never find them. That's a waste of time. I mean, you've got this list to where it's like, okay, if I ever see these products out and about, I for sure will scoop them up. But other than that, the reason why they're a bolo, a be on the lookout for is because they're hard to find. So if you're just going and trying to find all the diamonds in the rough, mining takes a long time. But if you already know how to find them based on scanning and putting stuff in your cart based on your guidelines and data points, then you don't need a bolo list. That's the thing is that really causes people to not do the work. It's kind of a lazy person's way of saying, give me some products to buy because I'm too lazy or I'm too overwhelmed or I'm too stressed or I'm too much of a beginner to figure this out for myself. No, you're not. All of those are not true. You are smart. You are intelligent. You've come to this far already. You know how to find products. So go do the work and stop trying to have shortcuts all the time. Sometimes there is no shortcut. You just do the work and the shortcut you create for yourself is doing it over and over and over and finding your own kinks in the chain so that you can figure them out and work them out, creating your own process and system that works for you. And that's what you should always have. This is business. This is not randomly willy nilly because I feel like it going on and not having a plan or a purpose. That's hobbies. That's things that you do just kind of that you're not taking seriously. If you're taking seriously, you have a plan, you have a routine, you have a schedule or something like that, a system and a process to say, when I go retail arbitraging, I have all these supplies. This is my list. These are my sourcing guidelines. These are what I do. Oh, by the way, if you want sourcing guidelines, we have a resource guide, mommyincome.com forward slash resources or go to our resource page or resource guide can't remember the exact link. I'm sorry. I'll put it below this video and in the show notes um, so that you guys can get the resource guide. Talking about your sourcing guidelines. We have guidelines. There's reasons with the things we buy and don't buy based on all the data. And I have a whole ebook about this. So go get the resource guide um, for sourcing because that will help you there. Okay. Learn to source smarter, set sourcing guidelines. That's part of why you don't need a bolo list. Learn how to make decisions for yourself in your business because somebody else's bolo list is not gonna be the list that maybe you want. Maybe the bolo list has you know vitamins or something on it and you don't wanna sell anything that's ingestible because you don't have that kind of insurance policy. These are just things to pay attention to and make note of. Um, use a bolo list as a jump start to fuel your ideas for looking for product, but really, this is just a systematic way of looking for inventory. It's, of course, what I said in the beginning, it's not my favorite, and you're actually building yourself a prison when you do this, um, eventually. But for now, if this is where you're at and this is what you're working with, great. I'm proud of you for even moving forward and doing a business. Do retail arbitrage and get into wholesale as fast as you can. So there's that. But learn to 
take a list and read between the lines and see, okay, if this is a popular product, if this is a discontinued product, if this is this, those will make good money and for a short period of time. But then you're stuck with the then what? If you buy a bolo and you find one of the bolo items on the list and you can buy 50 of them and that's all they have and that's all you can find, then you have 50 products. But if you spend that same time in a wholesale catalog, finding something that you can buy that makes you a similar amount of profit, then guess what you get to do with that wholesale product? Reorder, reorder, reorder. You're not going to go out from store to store hunting down this discontinued treasure and hope to find 50 of them one time. If you find one product that you can sell 50 of um, on wholesale, then you can repeat that over and over and over again. So that's what I encourage people to do rather than chasing down a bolo that you can make one time. It's better to do something that you can repeat. Okay. Another thing to avoid, retail arbitrage mistakes to avoid, is stop buying top branded, highly counterfeitable items. Okay, so yes, things sell well. Coach purses and Michael Kors bags or, you know, Kate Spade stuff does really well now um, because she's no longer with us. And for the last couple of years, the stuff has been flying. The store is still open. They're still doing that. It still has the Kate Spade brand. Uh, only the older stuff tends to go well, whatever else. But here's the problem with buying high top branded items, especially from places like Marshalls, Ross, TJ Maxx, discount stores that end up with some of this merchandise is that these are highly counterfeitable items. There's a lot of counterfeits out there. If you do not know how to identify a counterfeit purse, even if you're buying it from TJ Maxx, leave it behind. It's not worth your account. It's not worth it. Plus, pl stores like Marshalls, TJ Maxx, uh, Ross, things like that, they have authenticity issues because their SKUs are not the original SKUs. So say they're, they're more like they buy a lot of liquidations from like big name stores. So say Neiman Marcus had um, a bunch of overstock items of some high end purses and, you know, things like that. So they sell that lot to Marshalls, TJ Maxx, Ross, places like that. And then they re-tag those items, even if they have original UPC tags, they re-tag them with a Marshalls tag or a TJ Maxx, their own SKU. And then that SKU ends up on the receipt. So what happens is your Michael Kors purse that you bought for $50 at TJ Maxx, then you sell for $150 on Amazon. Your customer gets that and they somehow think it's a fake and they're like, oh, this is this is a total knockoff. And they report it to Amazon as a counterfeit item. And Amazon comes to you and they say, hey, prove that this is authentic. And you whip out your, you know, TJ Maxx or Marshall's receipt and you're like, oh, it's right here. Except for the UPC code that matches the Michael Kors bag that's out there doesn't match the UPC code that you have on your receipt. And so Amazon says, no good these don't match, inauthentic claim, shutting your store down. Not worth it. Sell things that customers want, but not high-end, very expensive things, unless you can somehow have official... Now, if you bought that from Neiman Marcus and you resold it, good luck with that because you're probably not going to get the right prices for that. But if you did, then that UPC code will be original from the manufacturer. It will match your receipt and that will be legit. But the discount stores re-tag their items or they have their own personal SKUs that they use within their store. And because of the SKUs that they use in their store, there's not a way to do that. So avoid high-end branded purses, wallets, shoes, handbags, belts, makeup, things like that. They're like, oh, if this is like a super high-end expensive brand, do not make sure that everything matches before you do that or just avoid it altogether. There's plenty of low-hanging fruit that you can make on retail arbitrage without selling expensive high-end branded items. Now, if you do want to sell expensive high branded items and you have the stomach for that, then go to their outlet stores. Go to the outlet. So if you want to sell a coach bag on Amazon, well, first of all, I don't know that they're going to let you create that SKU. But if you do, and if they do allow that, then for certain brands, I don't know, I don't have all the brands memorized that we can list and not list, but I'll tell you that. Go to the outlet store, get some really, really good stackable deals, get some purses for cheap, and then they're all authentic. They have original tags. You have original receipts for that. So if someone claims inauthentic on you, you have proof. But again, the burden of proof will still be on you 
And most of the time, Amazon wants invoices. Although if you bought a Kate Spade purse that you didn't love and they wouldn't take the return and it still has the tags, you can sell that on Amazon and you do have a receipt for it. So that's okay. But avoid those stores like Marshalls, TJ Maxx, and Ross. Avoid, no, go there and buy stuff because those are great places to do retail arbitrage. However, avoid those really high expensive brands because otherwise the burden of proof is going to be impossible and you're going to get strikes on your account and you don't want that. So go to those stores, just buy lower end not lower end, just mid grade or whatever else you buy, because those are great stores to do retail arbitrage in. Just avoid the super high branded items. Okay, mistake number three to avoid in retail and online arbitrage is when you are new and you have no idea what sells and what doesn't, or you don't really know about the categories and all of those things, don't be picky and selective and don't go ping ponging around the store. Go to a specific section of the store and be consistent. Scan every single thing in that aisle or in that section or on that shelf. Don't discriminate. Don't get picky. Don't get selective. Just because you've never heard of it doesn't mean it's not popular. It's possible that it is. But like those are things that's like start with your knowledge bank too. If you love home decor, start in home decor. You know what's trendy. You know what's good. You know what people like. If you're into car parts, I don't know, go to AutoZone and like scan stuff there. I went to I think AutoZone or O'Reilly's one time when, some, when I was doing a retail arbitrage challenge and I was doing live challenges like I can make money at any store, like tell me a store and someone picked AutoZone. It was, I was like, I hate you guys. I can't believe you're sending me to AutoZone. But live, I went into AutoZone live and scanned products in order to find profit, which I did find. I think I found some Hello Kitty seat covers that were selling for a pretty penny on Amazon. But they were expensive because places like AutoZone are expensive. But there is profit anywhere. The other store they sent me to was 7-Eleven. <laughs> now, I don't know if you guys have 7-Eleven wherever you are in the country. Basically, like high end, like high, very expensive convenience store. It's basically like your gas station um, convenience store where, you know, candy bars are like $3 and, you know, crazy stuff like that. They're like, go find profit at 7-Eleven. And I was like, I actually did. But it was, it took me a few <laughs> minutes to figure it out. Um, but yeah, you can still find profit in places like that. But, you know, I wouldn't recommend a 7-Eleven, to be honest. But you don't, what you don't do is cherry pick. You've got to scan an entire product line or an entire shelf. So say you're going to go to Target and you're going to do retail arbitrage um, product sourcing. That's what we're going to call it. You're using your app. You're using Scottify too, hopefully. And if not, using your Amazon seller app is just fine. And you're going to go to one specific aisle and you're going to scan every package. Why? Because you're learning too. You don't know what sells. And if you have no idea, that's where you start. Um, and then you learn something. You realize, okay, Amazon has a lot of these brands or these are a lot of high-end brands um, that I can't sell or they're restricted or whatever else. So you're learning something. But you can also do image searches and everything else. So don't be cherry picking. You might, the thing that you left on the shelf next there because you thought, oh, that's not going to sell, could have been the one that you made the most money on because you skipped it. You'll never know. So be thorough. Don't be picky or selective. Start with your knowledge bank and what you actually know more about. Like I love cornhole, right? So I um, gravitate towards products with that because I know about the products. I know about what they are. I know their design. I know what they're used for. So if you're into snow skiing or knitting or whatever it is that you're into, start with those products. Go to those stores. Why? Because you know about how much things cost, about what would be competitive. Maybe you know some brands, all those types of things. So go in that direction because you already have a place to start from. Don't just be like, oh, well, I saw a video on YouTube and it said this thing was the most popular, so I'm going to start looking up brands for this thing. Well, if you don't know anything about it, then you're already behind the eight ball. So you might as well start with some products and product lines that you already know about so that you can get it. It, it gives you a head start. Take notes, um, take pictures to give. This is education. You're not just making money and scanning stuff on this shelf for your own personal benefit um, and profit, which is, of course, at the end game. But take notes because you're going to learn something because the next time you go back to that store, you don't have to go into that aisle. You already know either A, I'm getting all these products to resell because I've already scanned these items and know which ones are my replens. And I've also already learned enough about this shampoo aisle or this bath 
bath towel aisle or whatever else to know, okay, these are good, these are not good, or these are something to keep in mind. Keep your notes. Um, what did you find? What didn't you find? Um, what were you looking for? Be deliberate and focused. That's really what you need to do. You have to have a plan. You don't just go in and be like, okay, after work, I'm doing some arbitrage today. It's like, okay, I have a plan. I remember when I was doing retail arbitrage and in here in the Midwest, um, we have Meyer. Um, which is like your equivalent to like a super Walmart, only, I don't know, it's just nicer and laid out a little bit better and usually has all the checkout lanes open and stuff like that. So it's just a little bit better than Walmart, in my opinion. I, they have different product selections, different brands, you know, things like that to where, um, you know, Walmart is more nationwide to where this is more of a five or six state area where we have Meyer. I mean, it's a huge store and they're everywhere, but only in the Midwest. So when I used to go to Meyer, the first place that I would go is their end caps because in each section and category of the store, they had these end cap clearances. So I would go to the end cap clearance first because I knew that was all the low hanging fruit. That was just like scan, scan, scan. These are discounted items. Are they expired? Yes or no. Um, basically making really quick decisions. And then I would have a certain section of the store that I would go to for that particular trip. And I would be like, okay, I'm scanning aisle five shelves one and two. And I would literally go down the entire aisle and scan every single thing on shelves one and two for that session. And whatever I found and however long it took me, that was how it was going to be. But I was very systematic about it because then I knew where I was going to start off next time I came in here. Now, is that the most exciting way to do it? Is it the fastest, most efficient way in the beginning? Maybe. But then after that, you know exactly what you're looking for. You fill up your cart with things you've already have experience with, and then you start looking for new stuff. So that's really how it works. But have a goal in mind, either a time or number or number of items scanned or whatever it is to be like, okay, today my retail arbitrage session is going to be three hours. And the first hour is going to be, you know, gathering or scanning all the clearance. And then it's going to be um, the health and beauty aisle, or it's going to be the bath towel aisle, or it's going to be whatever else. And just having a system and a plan. A lot of times people just go in, they don't have a plan, they don't have a purpose, and then they whine about not finding any product to sell. Well, when you get poke them for their process, they're like, oh, I don't really have a process. I just went in here and I scanned this and I scanned that and I scanned this and I just didn't find anything. So I left. And your efforts meet your result. <laughs> so make sure before you start throwing in the excuses that you had a system, a process, and a plan. And even if you came out empty handed, then at least you knew you did your best. You had a plan, you had a purpose, you knew what you were doing, you knew exactly. And sometimes you'd come up empty handed. And that's the craziest, saddest part about retail arbitrage is there are some times when you can go into stores and you only have a few hours to scan because maybe this is your side hustle and you didn't find anything. So now you have no inventory for this week or this month or whatever it is. And you have to go back out and do this again tomorrow and still not find anything. So that's the struggle. The struggle is that you're not guaranteed you're going to find profitable products and you're definitely going to struggle to find, you know, especially if something was on clearance, that's not going to be there next time. So your clearance items might have sold great, but they're not on clearance anymore because they're not there because they're discontinued or gone. So paying attention for those items as well. That's something that you just want to have a plan, a process in place to be able to to be able to repeat it, repeat the process. That's how you become more efficient. You make more money in less time when you have a plan, a process, and a procedure for being able to do these things. So that is my soapbox for that. I really don't make that mistake. Don't be that guy or girl that walks in and doesn't have a plan and sort of just randomly, you know, it's like shooting a basketball blindfolded. <laughs> it's like you might have the skills to throw a great free free throw. But if you're not standing at the line with your eyes open, you're just aiming at the wind. Like, who knows? Um, so you have to just have a process and a plan and, and think about those things. Okay. Number five, mistakes to avoid. Avoid not looking for replenishable items. So what, that's one of the things you want to do on a regular basis while you're retail arbitraging is avoid the one-offs. Search for replenishable items. When I say replenishable items, it's consumable items or items that people buy again and again because they wear out quick or they use it a lot or it's consumable. Um, when I say consumable, that means topical and ingestible as well. You're talking food, health and beauty products, shampoo, anything that's used 
regularly, often, and replenishable. But here's the other problem with that is you make sure that you have the proper insurance to cover ingestibles and topicals if you're doing retail arbitrage because there's expiration dates involved in these things. And guess what Amazon does not do for you? They do not monitor those types of things. It's up to you to put those dates in there. And if somebody returns something and it goes back to Amazon and they put it back on the shelf, uh, you're liable for that as well. So just use with caution, but also it's low hanging fruit. Um, you know, things like my kids granola bars that we they buy every single week without fail, same over and over and over again. That's just something that people buy regularly. It runs out, it wears out, you have to repurchase them. These are also lower cost items as well, which is great for beginners. But always look for replenishable items. If you're always hitting the clearance and you're never really going around the rest of the store to look for other things and you're a lot of times, you know, doing all that, add it to your repertoire. Because guess what? It doesn't also have to be food um, or topicals. You know what's used very, very, very often on a regular basis that people constantly run out of? <laughs> Think of 2020, toilet paper, you know, things like that. Now you, you're laughing and I'm not saying you should sell toilet paper because honestly, I'm sure Amazon Pantry has that locked down already. But, you know, toilet paper, um, napkins, uh, things like toothpicks or, um, you know, toothbrushes, toothpaste, um, health and beauty, coffee creamer. I used to sell so many coffee creamer, like different flavors of coffee creamer. The problem was Amazon changed their um, expiration date requirements. And unfortunately, they just that you can't sell them, um, be, at least not FBA, because they they don't meet the expiration requirements that Amazon has. So that was something that was used to be a huge seller of ours that we discontinued because we couldn't we couldn't match the expiration date requirements that Amazon has. So that's something else you have to pay attention to. Now, if you want to merchant fulfill, meaning you're holding inventory at your house and you're shipping it when customers order it, then merchant fulfill is easier to do some grocery items with as well. But then a lot of people just want to buy those prime and you're not qualified for prime when you're doing merchant fulfilled. So I stay away from it. I don't like to do anything with expiration dates. Occasionally I will, but it's not really my forte at all because I also don't want the liability. But if you're in that space already, constantly looking for something that you can replenish. Um, replenish means people buy these things over and over and over again, and it's just a good niche to get into. Things also that people don't realize are replenishable are like art supplies, uh, things that run out and wear out, office supplies, pens, pencils, paper, uh, things that you use every day that you have to replace because it it's consumable. So looking for those things. And adding seasonal items. Like a lot of times people steer away from seasonal. They're like, I just want evergreen items. I don't want to worry about seasonal, but there's big money in seasonal stuff. Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving and Halloween and St. Patrick's Day and Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve. Like there's so, so many holidays and events and things like that that are short-term runs, but you can make decent money at those short-term runs. So don't avoid um, the seasonal items and bringing those to the table as well, because you will be surprised at how much money you can make on those items as well. And of course, the number one mistake to avoid is not diversifying your business models. Now, if you're just doing retail arbitrage and online arbitrage, diversifying into a little bit of wholesale, a little bit of private label, a little bit of a something other than just to experiment with it. It's not difficult. Most of you guys could probably have your, you could have wholesale catalogs in your hands by the end of today. It's not complicated to start wholesale. If you have a reseller certificate, you could literally get wholesale catalogs by the end of today. You have a reseller certificate, you have it. Most of you guys should have that already, even if you're doing retail arbitrage, because it helps you become tax exempt when you go to big lots, for example, and you're buying stuff for resale. You give them your sales tax ID, you file for a tax exempt, and you can walk in there and get your purchases tax exempt, which you should be doing anyway if you're retail arbitrage because you are not the end user and you're reselling that. So that to give you tax exemption for that. Each state operates differently when it comes to tax exempt forms and things like that, but you need your reseller certificate in order for that to happen. 
So trying wholesale, and this is 80-20, right? This is the 80-20 principle I'm always telling you guys about. 80-20, meaning do what is working really well for you 80% of the time. And you have to incorporate new is the 20% of the time. So if you're spending 10 hours a week on your Amazon business, spend eight of those hours on your retail arbitrage and two hours of that on something new and different, whether it's wholesale or private label or a whole nother business or you're buying Bitcoin or whatever it is, spend your business hours incorporating new things. Because guess what? What, you, what, what got you here won't get you to the next step. You're going to have to learn and change and grow and adapt in order to get to that next level. The next level stuff starts now. It starts with 20% of your time allocated for your business going into something new, new that you don't understand, new that you want to learn, new that you want to step into. It doesn't mean you're committing any money to that just yet, but maybe it's committing time or money to education so that you're aware. So while you're padding your pockets with retail arbitrage, you're learning how to do wholesale orders. Then you're learning how to do bundles. Then you're learning how to do private label. And then you literally have all of these options retail arbitrage, wholesale, wholesale bundling, um, bundling in general, then you've got private label. You want, by the time you get done with your 80-20, you'll have five business models that you can use on Amazon and then some. So maybe the new thing you want to learn is KDP. Maybe you want to learn um, print on demand or POD or all these different things. That's great. 80-20, 80 of what's working and making you money right now, 20% for basically your come up, what you're going to do next. So what's going to make you more money? What's going to put you at the next level? So that is where wholesale bundles comes in. Not only will you learn wholesale, but you'll learn bundles. And guess what? You can do retail arbitrage bundles. You can do private label bundles. You can do wholesale bundles. Once you learn bundling and wholesale, now you have two new business models. Because guess what? I sell straight up wholesale items as well, not just bundles. Most of my items are bundles because I believe that's the best way to make the most money on Amazon. Um, but I do I do wholesale as well. Because someone comes to me and is like, oh, do you, do you just do regular? Can you do regular wholesale too? Do you only do bundles? And I'm like, well, mostly I do bundles because that's what has made me the most money. But I love regular wholesale as well. If I can order 100 units from something and get free freight and get the price down and sell it on Amazon with no competitors or very little competitors. I'm all into that. Why? Because I'm not going to clearance sections and scanning stuff and trying to get the most out of my $50 that I have to spend. So I've, I've come from there to where I'm at now. And I'm just trying to bring you guys along with me because I've been there and done that and know that retail arbitrage is great for a time but it's time to grow up and to get into regular wholesale at least and then start bundling because that's where really the money is. And eventually you're creating your own products or your own product line or even your own brands, um, brands that might be recognized, you know, at some place. But it's all about what you want in your business. So, so you have to figure that out first and then I can help you with the rest. <laughs> I can lead you in the right direction if you already know which direction you'd like to travel into. And if you don't know, great, we can talk about that too. But I'm just here to help and support you and hopefully kick you out of kindergarten kind of thing. It's time to like move into the next step. And so mommyincome.com slash system. Do not forget about this three day coupon code for 50% off. This is really so rare. I almost like choked on those words. <laughs> coupon code is half off. The word half off is all one word. Mommyincome.com slash system. This is going to save you 50% off the wholesale bundle system for the next three days. And guess what? Some of you guys don't know. Maybe you're a brand new listener. Maybe you've been here for all seven and a half years that Mommy Income's been open. But Wholesale Bundles is coming brand new in the next few months. Wholesale Bundles is a brand new system that's coming out. And guess what? If you get Wholesale Bundles now, you get all the new updates, the brand new course that's coming um, for today's price. So that price is definitely going up. There's a lot of work involved in doing more than 50 videos in this course and downloads and checklists and templates and everything that Wholesale Bundles is now only better. <laughs> um, and it's coming and you get all those updates if you purchase now because these are free lifetime updates. So if you get it at today's price and then the price goes up by $500, you still get today's price. So mommyincome.com forward slash system. Your coupon code is half off and it is good until March 17th, 2020. That's it.
three days. So if you want it and you've been wanting wholesale bundles or you've been curious and interested in it, today's your day. Today is your special day. It's half off mommyincome.com slash system three day coupon. You guys, I know you could be anywhere else doing any other thing right now. And I don't take that for granted. Thank you so much for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. And please leave us a review. Make sure that you're subscribing so that you don't miss things like a three day coupon and that you're listening and you can hear here. Um, please share it with your friends. Leave a review if you have 10 seconds, because literally that's all it is. And I would love to um, hear your feedback as well. You can always email us at admin at mommyincome.com and we'll see you same time same place next week on the amazon files